This DVD is based on best practice so that everyone in the industry can benefit from it. It's imperative that you use this DVD in conjunction with your study guide as provided, as well as your user manual as supplied by your supplier. We will be joined by experts ranging from importing, manufacturing as well as installations. I know you'll find this DVD very informative. One very important principle of solar is to understand that cold water has a higher density than hot water. This implies that hot water particles are lighter than cold water particles. That will force cold water down through the panel. Once this panel heats it up, it will actually force the lighter particles to rise. Once that rises, you will start a circulation effect. To demonstrate, we will use food coloring to illustrate the direction of flow. Okay, John, we're going to use a bit of, of humor to illustrate yeah. orientation of panels. So we've brought in a Monopoly set yep. with all the fancy areas over there. What would you say using the compass and everything, where would we actually want uh, our panels to be? Okay, first thing is definitely take notice of the compass. It is facing north. We want to find where north is. Taking that into consideration, putting your collectors on this side, brilliant. This is probably about your best possession because you're going to get a lot of morning sun, but primarily afternoon sun. Coming to this side, you're losing a little bit of your morning sun, so it's not quite as good, but you're getting your afternoon sun, and that's the important thing. So it's still going to work. What you can't do is go on the back. And that is? Because it's facing south. You're not going to get any sun there, and it's not going to work. For there and for over here, east, you'll get a little bit of bit of morning sun, but it's not going to help you, so it won't work. So that's a bit of a lottery. So our orientation of a panel is obviously very important. What is your comments in this regard? Yeah, it's one of the most important factors. You're going to need to have a north-facing uh, roof where the panel is faced on, put on the north side of a house or building. We're in the southern atmosphere, so the sun's optimum em energy mm -hmm is on the north side of our roof. What do you do if a house doesn't have a north-facing roof? If you don't have the luxury of north-facing roof, it's rather that you install it to the northwest or west to optimize the sun's energy and radiation during the course later during the day. The sun's temperature is much higher later during the day and it's also much longer during the end of the day. The usage of hot water is also mostly used in the evening than in the morning. What is the optimal inclination of a panel? Uh, rule of thumb is the inclination of your panel on the roof should be latitude plus 10 degrees. Reason for the latitude is in winter or summer you've got a different angle from the north side of the sun. Winter time it's more from the side and then summer time it's more from the top. Yeah. So we want to get that angle correct to optimize the efficiency of the energy from the sun on our panel. Where is the best place to place a panel? Is it important to have it closer to your geyser or not? It is very important to have the geyser and the panel as close to each other. The lesser distance yes, you have yes. from between your panel and your geyser, the lesser heat loss you might occur of that. If it's too long, the pipe work, you can lose more heat and energy than when it's closer. So it's very important to try and have your panel and your geyser as close as possible. Another way to explain the importance of orientation of a panel is by this example. This panel is facing north. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. By facing north, you're actually enabling the panel to collect maximum rays from the sun throughout the day. John, there are obviously various roof types out there, of which the most common ones are tile, slate, corrugated iron and thatch. What would you say are the risks associated in terms of waterproofing and drilling of each one of these roof types? 
Okay, Dion, the tile and slate are very similar. They're both a natural product. The first thing you need to remember is not to use your hammer function on your drill. If you do, you will shatter the tile immediately. Second thing you need to remember is not to drill in the valley, but rather drill on top of the hill. It's quite obvious water is going to run down in the valley. It's going to be less likely to run on the hill. When you do drill, what you want to do is drill a small hole and then slowly ream it out to fit your pipe or whatever you're going to be using. And in terms of corrugated iron? Corrugated iron is very simple. Obviously use the correct drill bits. You need a steel drill bit for it. Drill on the hill, not in the valley. Um, once again, you want to drill a small hole and then ream it out. With waterproofing on this especially, because there could be movement on it, make sure that you do proper waterproofing on it. John, we've just secured the pipe onto the corrugated iron. It's obviously very important to seal it properly. Can you please explain the best methods to do that and what are the risks associated to each one of these uh, actions? Obviously, you've got a lot of space around here that could let a lot of water through. So it's very important to seal it properly. This is one area where you don't want to save money. You want to put your sealant on as liberally as possible. Best product is Seekerflex. It's basically a silicon sealant. What you want to do is use your finger, squish it around here, get it into all the nooks and crannies, then go inside and do it from the bottom as well. Because obviously there is movement and expansion on both of these pieces of metal. Working on a roof, safety is obviously always important. So what are the aspects that you'll be looking for when you work on a roof? Okay, I think the first thing you need to consider is structure. You need to make sure that the structure is strong enough. Uh, I would recommend that the first thing you do is climb inside the roof, make sure that the brand rings, any woodwork inside is strong enough. Check for wood rot, things like that, or even cracked members. Once you've done that, then you can go outside. What should you be looking out for on a tile roof like this? Okay, on a tile roof, your first thing you want to do is look for any, any damage. I've got an example here. What you want to do is, if you find any broken tiles, you want to be able to photograph it and then show it to the client. It's obviously very important that you show it to the client, that way they know what's happened. And also you don't have any repercussions in the, po in the future. The other thing you need to be aware of then is that there could be structural weakness there because that could have caused the tile to break. And slate roofs? Slate roofs. Uh, slate is also a natural product. The difference with slate is that you generally have a very high inclination with that. With a high inclination, obviously you've got a good angle over there. So the first thing you need to look out for and worry about is your harness. Make sure that you've got a good harness and that it's well secured. Okay, and what do you think about corrugated iron? Corrugated iron is wonderful. It's nice to work on. But look out for the modern stuff because it's very soft. It's comma three millimeters thick and you can actually feel it. When you get on the roof, you can immediately feel. If you push down with your hand, you'll feel it buckle very easily and that's going to be a very big problem for you. What, do, what would you say would be the minimum tools that you require to work on a roof in terms of safety? Safety harness is obviously your first thing. You want to make sure that you've got a good safety harness and make sure that it's well secured. Suntan Lotion is also very important because obviously you're working out in the sun and if you don't put suntan lotion on it will get you. And then shoes. You want to make sure that you've got good shoes that have very good grip. It's very important for that. Bear in mind that you are working on a roof so you need good grip with it. And um, do you think safety goggles is important? It is, yes, very definitely. When you're drilling things like that it's a good idea to wear safety glasses. You're going to be making a lot of dust. Obviously, you don't want that dust to get into your eyes. Other than that, you probably aren't going to want to wear them. But when you're drilling, yes, especially. John, a ladder is obviously a very important part in the armory of an installer. What would you say are very important things to consider when using a ladder? Yeah, and I think the first thing is the sizing of the ladders. Make sure that you use the right size for the right application. Don't try and use a ladder that's far too long 
And if you do have to put it against gutters, try and put something inside the gutter to stop it from being crushed. In terms of scaffolding? Scaffolding, the problem is that you need to go on a course to be certified to use scaffolding. So for the time being, I'd say no, but if you do go on a course, you would be able to use scaffolding. What are the most important things to consider before doing any maintenance on a geyser in terms of the electrical side? The first thing, very important thing, is to switch off the circuit breaker of your geyser at your main DB box in the house. The second step is when you're in the roof, normally close by to the geyser, you'll have an isolator switch which you switch off. The reason why there must also be an isolator switch which you switch off is if someone in the house should switch on the circuit breaker again, or there's a fail on the circuit breaker that you still cover in safety on the electrical work on the geyser. The multimeter, after you switch off the isolator, you can actually test with a multimeter if there's power to the wires or not. In this case, we've switched on the power to illustrate the um, power is on. So if I switch it, put a multimeter there, you can have a reading showing you that there's live power going there. When we switch it off, and there's no reading, you'll see there's no reading, we know now that there's no power to the wires. Then we can disconnect the electrical wires from the elements, handling one by one. It's always safer to handle wires for one by one, because it's active when you use two and there's suddenly some power come through. So just for safety reasons, handle one wire at a time, don't touch both ends at the same time. John, there are some differences between a solar geyser and an electrical geyser. Can you please indicate what those are and why they are so important? Okay, standard electrical geyser will have three ports. Your drain cock, your hot water outlet, and on the far side your TP valve. The other difference is that your insulation is not quite as good and your electrical consumption is quite a bit higher. The 150 in general is around 3000 watts and the 200 litre is around 4000 watts. Firstly, your insulation is a lot better. Your ports, you have your standard ports, which is your drain cock, hot water outlet, and your TP valve. But importantly, you have two additional outlets. One is obviously to send hot water to your collector, and the other one to, is to receive it. The other thing is that your electrical component is better. Um, on the 150 and the 200 liter, you'll have around 2,000 watts. John, this is obviously a top quality flat plate. What should be the main features of a collector like that? Flat plate, SABS requirements are, or at least desire are, minimum four millimeter toughened glass. It is very important that it's toughened, not anything else. What would happen is if this glass had to break, uh, it wouldn't shatter like normal glass and cut, you, cut people. It would work like a windscreen of a, of a car. It would break into little bits and pieces. That way nobody's gonna get badly hurt. Other components are, you'd have risers in. This particular collector has nine risers. Obviously going from the top, running to the full length of it, which is very important. And then you've got your header and your footer pipe. So how does it function? How does it uh, work? Okay, very simple. Your cold water will come in at the bottom over here, on either side, will heat up. As it heats up, naturally it wants to flow to the top. And then it will come out on the opposite side. So for instance, if you had to use this side over there as the cold, your hot outlet will be on the opposite side. That way you're using the full spectrum of your collector. So what are the different types of systems that you get in terms of flat plate collectors? These flat plates can be used for active systems. In other words, what you'd do is you'd have your geyser below the collector. 
You'd use a pump and a controller to cause the circulation, or you can use it for thermosiphon. Thermosiphon, your geyser would be above the collector, and then a natural process of hot water rising would cause the flow. We've now come to the most important part of this whole exercise, the installation of an active split system. What would you say, in terms of step one, what would be the most important thing to do now? Yes, Dion, what you want to do is firstly have a look at the condition of your roof. Make sure that there aren't any broken tiles or weak points. You're going to go inside looking at your brand rings and your roof trusses. Make sure that they are strong and solid. If there's any problems there, then you need to be very concerned about that. What about safety? Yes, safety first. Uh, harnesses, make sure that you've got harnesses, that they're well secured before you start climbing up. Hard hats, also very important. And when you're drilling things like that, make sure that you've got your glasses. In terms of orientation and inclination, how important is that? Orientation, you're looking for north for the westerly bias. Um, positioning, you want to get it as close to your geyser as possible obviously bearing in mind the orientation. Inclination, you're looking at around 36 degrees in Gauteng. The way it's calculated is it's latitude plus 10 degrees, wherever you are. So John, what will step two then be? Okay, firstly you want to cut off your water supply. Inside the roof, you'll find a stopcock, make sure that it's properly closed. Then go to your DB board and switch off your geyser. Then go back into the ceiling again, and switch off the isolator switch. Once you've done that, what you want to do is take your multimeter and test on the geyser itself to make sure there is no current whatsoever. We finished step two, we're going over to step three, what would you say is the next thing to do? Okay Dion, you want to get back into the ceiling, you want to make sure that the stop cock is properly closed. Next, you're going to open up your drain cock, open up a tap and remove one of the, the vacuum breakers. Why would you want to do that? Because if you don't remove the vacuum breaker, the water is going to drip out very, very slowly. By removing the vacuum breaker, it's going to allow air in, mm. which allows the water to escape properly. And how do you remove the geyser? Okay, once it's fully drained, then if it's small enough, you can take it down the manhole or opening in the ceiling. If not, you're going to remove some tiles. We're now going to commence the installation of the panel of a split system. Miles, where do we start? First step is to locate your brand ring underneath your tiles, obviously because we can't fit to the tile itself. We need the strength of the branding underneath. Um, that will require you to move a few tiles. Uh, for this illustration purpose, we can see the brand ring. But um, whilst on the roof, you would have to move a tile, locate your brand ring, position your panel in, in place. Um, your hot side always comes from the top, and your cold feed will always come from the bottom side on the opposite side it can be opposite this way or it can be opposite this way the reason for the opposing sides is to create flow your cold water will come in feed through the, the panel itself rise up and come out the hot side on the opposite end what do we use these bolts for those bolts are designed to raise the panel slightly off of the roof to allow debris leaves and twigs to flow past the panel and not dam up and effectively cover the glass making the panel less effective
Right, we've now established where our panel needs to go. Uh, we can see over here where our brand ring is. It runs underneath the double layers of the tiles. So that's effectively where we need to drill to put our carriage bolt in. Our next step is to mark exactly where we want that bolt to go in with the panel in position. Once your position is marked, then we can now go ahead, move the panel slightly away for safety purposes. You do not want to damage the glass and we can drill through the tile and start the installation of the carriage bolt. Right, now that we have our position of our hole, we are ready to drill our hole. I just want to take a moment to give a couple of pointers. We use a masonry type drill, seeing as though we're going through tiles. It will need some cooling, so have some water handy to cool the drill bit down, otherwise you'll just burn out the tip. Uh, second important factor is that we are on the hill and not in the valley, so that it's easy to waterproof the, the hole afterwards. And be sure not to have the drill on the hammer function because it will break the tile. When nearing the end of the second tile with the drilling with the masonry drill, ease back on the pressure to ensure that you do not go into the brand ring because the drill you're using to go through the tile is larger than the carriage bolt that's going to go through there and you will not have a tight fit. Now that we've drilled our hole through both tiles, we make sure that we're hitting brand ring and that we've got something secure to fix our bolt to and we're ready to go ahead and secure the bolts in place. Now that our bolt is secured with our anchor point, we're now ready to waterproof the bolt. Ensure that you apply the silicon liberally to get 100% seal. Right, now that we have successfully fastened our four roof bolts into the brand ring underneath the tiles, we are now going to go in and tighten the panel to the bolts. You can see we've moved the panel into place. Now we're going to proceed with tightening the panel and adjusting the panel's height off of the roof tiles. Right, we're now going to adjust the bottom bolt on the roof bolt to adjust the height of the panel off of the tiles. For this installation, I'm going to use a height of 30 millimeters. Right, now that we have our desired height, we are now ready to place the panel onto the bottom bracket. First, first point to ensure is to make sure that the roof bolt is not too close to your copper pipe so that you can adjust your fitting, you've got workroom. The next thing is we're going to want to take the top bolt and the top bracket off to make it a little bit easier to handle. After removing the top bracket and bolt, we can then proceed to put in our protective sponge to stop the galvanic reaction between the stainless steel and the aluminium. We then replace the top brackets in the opposite direction of the bottom brackets and get ready to fasten up. It definitely helps as well to have someone on the roof to help you hold the panel up just to take the weight off while adjusting the height of the panel. As you can see we've, we've tightened and connected the panel to the roof it's securely fit with these bolts. There's clear daylight between the collector and the roof over there. That's to make sure that there's no leaves getting stuck here. The panel will not get damaged by water whatsoever. 
Miles, what would you say is the next step? Now that our panel is nicely secure and in place and we're happy with the position of the panel and the inclination, we can now start plumbing the pipes through the roof to go connect with the geyser. Right, for illustrative purposes, we have not gone through the roof for this cold water feed assembly. Uh, what you would do in real life is measure, measure from your collector to the heel of your tile for waterproofing purposes, drill your hole, then cut and dry fit your plumbing before you solder it all together. Once you're happy with your shape, like we do have right here, you will solder all the connections 100%, ensuring to clean the pipes using flux, PTFE tape where there's thread on thread, fasten everything up nicely, and then lag the system. Right, so I'll be moving over to the flow side of installing the solar geyser. S step one is install the male geyser to, to Konex fitting. Then on your 22mm pipe, installing that. <laughs> 